You ready? Ready. So there, turn me. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's nice to introduce uh, such an honorable meeting. Uh, this meeting is one of a series uh, that, inshallah, is going to be starting uh, with the Kentucky University in the United States of America uh, under supervision uh, of our colleague, uh, Professor uh, Amf. And I would like to welcome our guests there, that we are honored to have them uh, amongst us, uh, Dr. Magdi Shraawi, Dr. Ahmed Halawa, Dr. Ala Sabri, Dr. Ghada, Dr. Nihal, and uh, a lot of uh, prominent and distinguished stars in the field of nephrology practice. Uh, I hope that the meeting will cover an important issue about the bone disease and uh, in chronic kidney disease and uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, transplantation, and uh, it, it will also be the first of a series of continuous medical education uh, that will be helpful to every nephrologist who is practicing or getting ready for any of the nephrology exams, including the, uh, the uh, doctorate degree in, in Egypt. Uh, uh, I think that the, the program is uh, is full of uh, distinguished speakers. Among them is uh, Iman Nagy, which will talk about the summary of the Kidigo guidelines in 2017. Uh, Karim Nagati will talk about uh, osteoporosis cases. And uh, Mohamed Mandouh will be talking about osteoporosis in CKD patients, diagnosis and management. And Nihal will be talking about post parathyroidectomy case. This is for today and tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be starting at the same time at four o'clock in the afternoon with our distinguished professor, Professor Amr Hosseini, uh, quantity and the quality, which is more important. Alamin and bone disease with Muhammad Sop, Professor Muhammad Sop, the professor, Dr. Mahmoud Sop, and uh, management of CKDMD. Uh, Ahmed Adil, Ahmed Abdel Wahab. And uh, our colleagues from Helwan will present an interesting case. Let us go on with the meeting. Mamdouh, uh, who will be the next? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nagy, for the nice introduction. Uh, we just have some modification of the uh, program. So inshallah, I'm going to start with the bone quantity and the quality. I'll uh, be talking for the next 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a case discussion uh, by Dr. Karim Nagati. Then Iman Nagy will present the, the uh, selective update, uh, the KDGO uh, CKD MBD uh, guidelines that was published 2017. Then we'll finish by another case presentation that will be discussed and presented by uh, Dr. Mahmoud Sob. That's today's agenda. Tomorrow's agenda, inshallah, I will start at the same time, 4 p.m., with Dr. Ahmed Abdel Wahab, management of CKD MBD, and uh, Dr. Nihal will present a case of aluminum intoxication uh, in dialysis patient. Then uh, uh, Mamdouh, uh, Mohammed Mamdouh Abdel Bari will, will uh, give a lecture on management of osteoporosis in CKD patients. And the last case discussion will be uh, by Halwan Group, Dr. Kariman Mahmoud. Uh, then we'll have uh, every day, today and tomorrow, we'll have 20 minutes discussion with experts so we can share um, ideas and uh, try to answer some questions and uh, try to um, discuss some concerns in CKD and BD management. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, start with my first uh, lecture, uh, bone quantity or bone quality, which one is uh, more important, especially in CKD patients. Uh, this concept, I just want to leave you with uh, one thing, that bone quantity is not everything because mm -hmm. we know how to assess bone quantity in our uh, CKD patient and uh, 
to assess the bone strength by doing DEXA scan that gives you uh, probably one piece of information, which is a bone density or bone quantity. But we have to also focus on the bone uh, quality because bone is not only bone density. Uh, it's not the uh, percentage of mineral bare area that we can assess by DEXA scan, but it's also the bone quality. That means the bone structure, the architecture, the bone turnover, the bone size, and geometry. So I just want to leave you with this concept that you need to focus not only on quantity, but also on quality. Both are complementary. So to have a strong bone, you should have good quality and quantity at the same time. I just want to say I don't have anything to disclose for this lecture. I don't get any money uh, you know, talking about bone quality or investigating uh, uh, bone quality for uh, our patients. And the objectives of this presentation briefly will be focusing on understanding the mechanism of bone loss and how can we use a, a assessment of bone quality and the bone quantity in our patients to improve their bone health and bone uh, structure. As you know that osteoporotic fracture is very common problem. So here we are not talking about a rare disease. We are talking about very common problem, especially in our patients with the advanced CKD or the ALSIS patient. Uh, here is a national database from uh, Canada. And uh, as you see, if you combine patients who had heart attacks, strokes, and uh, breast cancer, which is one of the most common cancer in uh, female, you see that uh, osteoporotic fracture actually overweigh all of these medical problems uh, if you combine all of them together. So it's very frequent. It's also good to mention that the bone fracture, we call it bone attack. So you have heart attack when patient develop uh, acute myocardial infarction, we call it heart attack. When the patient develop fracture, it's bone attack. So in cardiology, we don't wait till the patient develop MI and have base of his myocardium now is dead, then we are trying to deal with the consequences. But we have primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Also in bone, we don't wait or we shouldn't wait till the patient fracture, then we intervene. We should have preventive measure to avoid fracture because fracture have very bad consequences in was increasing patient mortality. If you see our CKD patient with declining of kidney function, there is remarkable and linear increase in the risk of fracture. So CKD patient, advanced CKD patient, especially 4-5 and dialysis patient, they have almost uh, eight folds higher rate of fracture compared to general population. And the big question is when somebody comes to you and asks you, is my bone strong? Do you need to do anything to strengthen my bone or to increase uh, the quantity or the quality of my bone? How can I, I assess this? And this is a very valid question. And all of us should be focusing on how to improve our, our bone because our skeleton is a cornerstone in our life. If you have good bone, probably you'll have better quality of life. And if you have better quality of life and if you stay active, the bone also will be stronger. As you see, this lady, um, this nice lady is trying to assess the length of her husband. So she stood on this stool. And if this stool is not strong enough, she can have a fall and fracture. So same concept here. How can we make sure that this chair or stool is strong enough? Mamdouh, just to make sure to be with everyone. So here are two seats. One is steel, which is probably denser from this wood chair. So 
if both have the same structure, the same architecture, the same hinge sphinx and connections, probably this denser structure will be stronger. Same concept. When we assess our bone, we usually focus on the density. But here, if you take out this hinges and hinges and connections from the seats, despite that the seat still is denser because it's uh, steel. So if you bought this in a machine, X-ray machine or DEXA machine, this one will be more radio opaque or will have higher density. However, this wood chair, because it has better structure, better architecture, it would be stronger because this one lost the connection and lost the strength because it has a bad structure. So it's not only the density, it's not only the quantity of bone, but the structure of bone, the percentage of collagen to mineral, the um, arrangement of the fibers, and the percentage of the inorganic to organic component of our bone. So by the end of the day, if you want uh, your bone to be happy, you need good density and good quality. So good quantity and quality. So the opportunity is now here or nowhere. They are both you know, have the same letters. It depends on the way that you read it. In the past, they used to teach us how to uh, be united. And if we are together, and if we have a bigger number, bigger quantity, uh, and united will be stronger. So it's not only the quantity or the number, but also the unity. However, also this guy who is, you know, he, he worked on himself very well. He built up muscle and of, of course bone. He can beat all of these guys. So quality is very, very important. When it comes to bone, so I hope you understand the concept now. It's not only the quantity, but also the quality. When it comes to osteoporosis, the definition uh, almost three decades ago, they, the WHO defined osteoporosis as a skeletal disorder characterized by low bone mass and microarchitecture deterioration of bone tissue leading to fracture. So there is two wings here. One wing is the low bone mass, the bone density or bone quantity. And the other wing is the microarchitecture deterioration, the bone structure, okay, the bone quality. And we all know that the operational definition for osteoporosis is the BMD with T-score less than 2.5. But this actually, in, especially in CKD patient, majority of fractures happen in patients who don't have uh, osteoporotic BMD. So more than 60% of women with fragility fracture have non-osteoporotic BMD. So we call it non-osteoporotic uh, fracture or non osteoporotic BMD fracture, they still can have osteoporosis, but if we just depend on this T score, we can miss a lot. The other definition, more than two decades ago, the um, yeah. NIH definition of osteoporosis is a skeletal disorder char characterized by compromised bone strength predisposing to increase risk of fracture, then they mentioned that the bone strength is a combination of and integration of bone density and bone quality. So bone strength is not only bone density or quantity, but also bone turnover, bone mineral to matrix ratio and bone architecture. Okay, so we know that the bone density, the minerals, because bone density gives you the mineral content, the bone mineral density or bone mineral content, and they compare it to matched population, either only matched to the gender and they give you T-score or matched also with the age and they give you Z-scores. But this gives you only 60% of the bone strength. 
the rest at least to 40%, and this is in general population, 40 to 60. But in CKD patient, actually they have a bone quality problem more than bone quantity problem. It might be 50-50, or the weight of the bone quality um, problem might be higher compared to the bone quantity. So we have to focus on that, especially in our CKD patients. So bone quality include metric probability, damage accumulation, the collagen quality, the crystal mineralization, the micro and the macro architecture. And now the question, how can we measure bone quality? We know that bone uh, scan, the DEXA scan is very, very popular. It's a good tool to assess the bone uh, quantity. But there is Another software you can add it to the machine called Terabicular Bone Score or TBS, it's very important. It gives you the structure of the terabiculus, the spine. So it evaluates the bone structure, bone microarchitecture of the spine. So just in a simple uh, DEXA scan, you can not only get uh, assessment uh, for the bone quantity, but also for bone quality. If you ask your radiologist, what is the TBS? What is the terabicular bone score? Is it bad or low? So this gives you some impression about bone quality. Then bone turnover markers, these are non-invasive biomarker we can examine in the blood, usually in the blood, in, in urine sometimes, but uh, majority in a blood biomarker can give you um, assessment of the bone turnover. Then we have high resolution image like the HRBQST, the high resolution peripheral quantitative CT scan that can give you good idea, virtual uh, idea about the bone quantity and bone quality as well. Then of course, the bone biopsy is a gold standard and there is other measures for bone quality I'm not going to talk to you about like FTIR, the frontier, uh, transform uh, infra uh, spectroscopy and other techniques that uh, probably it's too complicated and uh, we don't have time to discuss today. But let's focus on DEXA scan, which is very popular and we use it all the time to assess our um, patient's bone health. So DEXA scan is very cheap, popular, quick. The radiation exposure is very low. It's non-invasive and it has some correlation with the gold standard, which is a bone biopsy with cortical porosity and dialysis beach. However, um, DEXA scan misses a lot of things. DEXA scan is only two dimensional, so it's not um, tri dimensional, so it doesn't give you, it uh, doesn't account for the bone, uh, you know, um, if it is a small or large bone. Also, in vision with advanced CKD, with cardiovascular calcification, it gives you higher readings, so it gives you false positive results. And also in super obese or moderately obese patient, it's inaccurate and also give you a false positive results. It doesn't measure the bone size. It cannot differentiate between cortical and terabicular bone and it's aerial density, it's not volumetric. If you want to get a volumetric assessment, you need to do a QCT. Um, scan. So DEXA scan also most importantly doesn't predict the type of renal osteodystrophy. It doesn't tell you if the patient have high or low turnover overgrown disease. So it will tell you that the density is low, but how, what is the mechanism behind this bone loss? How to treat this bone loss is another thing that doesn't give you. As we said, trabecular bone score, you see this, these two patients has identical BMD bone mineral density with the DEXA scan, but if you do the, you know, the TBS, the terabicular bone assessment and bone score, you see this patient have very bad architecture. This patient, despite they have the same BMD, they are different with the structure or microarchitecture. So here's the TBS in the green side, which is normal. Here, this guy TBS is low in the red, which is a red flag, so has a bone quality problem. And I want you to compare, you know, here, if you have uh, osteoporosis, you have, of course, higher risk of fracture, especially if you have also bad or poor or low TBS. That's column E. On the opposite side, 
if you don't have osteoporosis and if your TPS is good, you have very low chance of fracture. But focus here, compare C to D. C are those who have osteoporosis, but they have you know, relatively good bone quality. The TPS is good. Compare those to D, these patients are not osteoporotic, but they are on the lowest tertile. They have low TBF. They have higher risk of fracture compared to C. They are non-osteoporotic, but they have higher uh, risk of fracture compared to the osteoporotic patients because they have lower trabecular bone score. So it's important to um, not only focus on the BMD or the T-score, but also on the trabecular bone score. And it's also have not only a prognostic uh, value, but also therapeutic implication as well, because some medication improve bone quantity, some in, you know, improve bone quality. So there's differential um, you know, response to medication. If you see like patients who are getting bisphosphonates, bisphosphonates actually can improve the bone density about 5%, but it doesn't help with the bone quality. Denozumab, it helps a little bit with the, with the bone quality and also improve bone quantity. BTH, the Forte or the 134 BTH that increase bone formation actually improve also the bone quality about 4%. And on the other hand, glucocorticoid, it doesn't really affect the bone density much, but actually it affects, it worsens the bone quality and the TBS more and also the anti-aromatase therapy. So it's important also uh, to select and choose the medication depending on the problem that you have. And as you know, we have very non-pharmacological and pharmacological intervention to improve the bone health. So the non-pharmacological interventions include exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise and the physical therapy, sun exposure to increase your uh, uh, vitamin D and calcium homeostasis, uh, you know, to eat uh, um, organic and healthy food, to you know, avoid smoking and avoid alcohol. All of these non-pharmacological intervention will improve both bone quality and the bone quantity as well. However, pharmacological therapies like uh, phosphate binder, vitamin D and uh, VDREs, calcium mimetic, and osteoanabolic or anti resorptive therapy has a differential effect on both the bone quantity and bone quality. So we need to understand the mechanism of bone loss. Is the bone loss for our patient uh, happen because of increased bone resorption or because of lack of bone formation? Because if the problem is increased bone resorption, we need to give anti resorptive therapies like bisphosphonates, benozumab, selective estrogen receptor modulator or calcitonin. But on the other hand, if the problem is uh, decreased bone formation, we need to give osteoanabolic like teribaratide, abaloburatide, and bromosomab. How can we understand that? We need to do uh, you know, bone turnover biomarkers. Biomarker is any measurable indicator of state of the body. So when we say, when we assess blood pressure or blood sugar, or creatinine or urine analysis, that's all biomarker to uh, examine an outcome. And when it comes to bone turnover, there is, uh, our bone is uh, all the time is very active and uh, there is a start, the cycle start with uh, bone resorption. So there is a build up and the break, there is bone modeling and remodeling all the time that starts with bone resorption on the osteoclast start to eat bone, and this is called um, uh, resorption pet. This is an osteoclast, multi-degraded giant cell. So it eats the bone. Then the osteoblasts will be recruited to replace the bone, first with a reversal stage, then with bone formation stage. So they filled in the gap, the resorption bed. Then the remodeling cycle will enter in a resting state. Then it will be uh, repeated again. And this usually takes about three to four month is uh, to complete this cycle. So our patients, CKD patients, they have problem with their bone turnover. They are either more commonly to have low turnover uh, bone disease. So the bone will be senile, will be like 
premature senility or aging, there will be unrepaired micro damage of the bone. It cannot heal because there is, the bone formation is very low and also the bone resorption is very low. So the turnover is low and it will be over mineralized just to all the bone, fragile bone. On the other hand, uh, about one third of our patient might have high turnover bone disease that induce under mineralization of the bone, induces stress risers and the loss of bone mass and structure. So we like to keep our patient here in physiologic range of bone turnover and avoid the bad consequences of high or low bone turnover. This bone turnover biomarker, it's a blood test that can help you to predict the bone loss and predict the fracture risk and identify the mechanism of bone loss and treat the patient according to this mechanism of bone loss. So choose to give uh, osteoanabolic uh, or anti-resorptive therapy and to monitor the response to this therapy. And also after finishing the medication, uh, you give the medicine for a year or two, then off uh, the medicine, do you need to monitor what happened to these patients? So it's complementary to the DEXA scan. It can gives you uh, assessment, a quick assessment in three months because if you wait a year or two after treating or not treating your patient, it might be very late. But if you examine this biomarker every three to four months, it will give you um, a, at least a crude um, idea about what's going on with the bone turnover. Is the bone formation is uh, better? Is the bone resorption is better or not? So we have many of them, but for the sake of the time in CKD patient, we use uh, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase as a bone formation marker. And we use something called tariterate resistant acid phosphatase as bone resorption marker. The rest of these biomarker, we use it in osteoporotic patient, the non-CKD patient, but they are retained in CKD patient. The only two markers that are not affected by the kidney function is a bone specific alkaline phosphatase and territory resistant acid phosphatase. Uh, if you cannot do uh, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase, at least look to the total alkaline phosphatase. It's very available, very popular. So look not only to the BTH of your patient, but also uh, to the total alkaline phosphatase. Of course, the uh, bone specific alkaline phosphatase has better correlation, but here the correlation also with the total alkaline phosphatase is not bad, just to make sure that the patient doesn't have a liver disease and, of course, not pregnant because these two conditions increase the total alkaline phosphatase. And here, if you use combination of biomarker like PTH and uh, bone specific alkaline phosphatase, if the bone specific alkaline phosphatase is more than 20, uh, especially if the BTH is more than 200, this excludes a dynamic bone disease. If the BTH is more than 200 and uh, the uh, total um, uh, alkaline phosphatase is high and bone specific alkaline phosphatase is more than 20, this has very good positive predictive value and specificity for high turnover bone disease. Um, then uh, these are the, uh, you know, the biomarker. What about the new technology to assess the bone? health and bone strength, we have the high resolution peripheral quantitative CT scan. It gives you the cuts <laughs> as 30 micrometer, uh, just using the second generation. Now there is the third generation, it's HRBQ CT machine. It's volumetric, so it gives you impression not only on the cortical bone, but also on the trabecular bone. See here's a cortex, see there's a trabecular. So it gives you a very good uh, impression. Actually, they call it virtual biopsy, it's 3D. So it can replace, hopefully this can replace the biopsy in the future, not by itself, but in combination with the biomarker, because this HRBQCD doesn't give you idea about the bone turnover, but will give you impression about the bone quantity and quality. Then you combine it with the bone turnover to understand the mechanism of bone loss. Hopefully in the future with improvement of uh, technology and you know, improvement of the resolution of this image, we can replace the invasive bone biopsy with these techniques. Uh, finite element analysis also is another way to do to examine the bone strength. And it's only done on the radius and the distal tibias is the reason that you call it peripheral because it's not done on the spine or the hip. It's only 
um, distally on the radius and uh, the tibia. And here you can see the difference between the control subject and the patient who has fracture. You see more borers. You see that the trabeculae is here uh, disconnected and very thin. So this is an osteoporotic patient, and this is a patient with uh, normal bone. So several studies in CKD patients showed if you combine the um, bone turnover biomarker with the high resolution for quantitative CT, you can actually have very good um, you know, uh, correlation with the bone histomorphometric parameters. So hopefully in the future, this can replace the bone biopsy. Till now, bone biopsy still is the gold standard for diagnosing the renal osteodystrophy and the CKD MDD. Here you can see the osteoblasts that start to form this osteoid, which is a collagen type one. Then this osteoid, the red thing, will be calcified. The mineral will come in, the calcium and phosphate and magnesium and hydroxyapatite. Then here is a calcified or mineralized bone, the strong bone, okay? Then here you can see this very big cells, which are the osteoclast. And this osteoclast induce bone resorption, so it eats the bone. It's very, you know, highly biologically active. This is also an osteoclast, but smaller, not as hungry as this one. So this one induces a lot of bone damage and bone resorption. This is an example of high turnover bone disease. We used to call it ostitis fibrosa cystica. Ostitis because there is, it looks like an inflammation, it's hyperciliary, you see a lot of cells. Ostitis fibrosa because there is bone marrow fibrosis that can actually induce anemia in our patients and cystica because it induced microcysts and then macrocysts by the end of the day. Uh, by the way, these cells called osteocytes, these are very plenty. It uh, consists about 95% of the bone cells are osteocytes. It used to be an osteoblast cell. Then when osteoblasts form a bone, it gets trapped in the mineralized bone and change its you know, function and structure and now it's called osteocytes it interconnect and form network of cells and secrete a lot of cytokines and hormones. Here is another spectrum of the disease with low turnover bone disease. So it's hypocellular. You cannot see these osteoblasts or osteoclasts and also the bone volume is low. These are all adipocytes. This is another also different spectrum with osteomalacia. When you see the osteoid is very thick. So the problem here, the osteoblast is still forming this collagen, but the problem with mineralization, there is severe vitamin D deficiency or hypophosphatemia that cannot mineralize this bone. And this is a mixed renal osteodystrophy. One side you see the osteomalacia and the other side you see the high turnover bone disease. If you are interested in this concept of bone quality, if you want to read more about it, we published two articles uh, in 2021 about how to assess and manage the bone uh, quality problem in our chronic kidney disease patient. As we know, prevention is better than cure, so we have to focus how to pre prevent the fracture and decrease the incidence of fracture in our patient, how to uh, better understand the bone health and the bone pathology in our patient. Knowledge is of no value unless we put it in practice, so we are not giving you this information just to best your master or MD or to be more knowledgeable, but to improve your patient practice. And the great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. Again, if you have any question, here is my email. You can email me at any time for any question or comment. Thank you so much for uh, listening and uh, I'm uh, ready for any questions. السلام عليكم دكتوره غاده ودكتور مجدي حضراتكم ممكن يعني ان ان شاء الله ثانك يو فيري ماتش بروفيسور عمرو ا فيري اليجنت فيري الستريتيف برزنتيشن ذات شود ايفري وان ذا ديفرنس بين كواليتي اند كوانتيتي ويتش از فيري امبورتنت اي ثينك اتس It's time to questions. If uh, there is question, I, I don't uh, so, think uh, we have question. Can, can I see the question in the yeah. screen? Yeah, can I, can uh, I see uh, that? Yes, we have one question in the chat. Uh, 
It is what are indications for bone biopsy in CKD patients. Okay, it's, it's very good. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, I think uh, Iman is going to uh, touch on this in her lecture because the indication has been changed uh, from the key DIGO guideline 2009 to 2017. Now, basically, the indication is there is no specific indication. I mean, the, it used to be there is a specific indication, seven or eight. Now we are open. So if you think that the uh, result of bone biops will help you to manage the bone disease of your patient, yeah, it's better to do it. Especially now we have a lot of bone intervention, a lot of anti-osteoporotic medication. So if you, your patient has osteoporosis or has bone loss and we, you, you want to identify the mechanism of bone loss and to understand what we call TMV, the, term, the bone turnover mineralization and volume, it's better to proceed and to do the bone biopsy to help you to manage your patient. Actually, uh, we have done uh, some bone biopsies in Egypt uh, uh, last year, and we are surprised with the results. I'm not going to talk about the results today, we have two bone uh, biopsy cases will be presented tomorrow and you will be surprised with the results. I just leave it till tomorrow. I don't want to burn out tomorrow's presentation. But sometimes you can find something that you are not anticipating with the bone biopsy result. Let me, let me ask you, Professor Amr, about bone biopsy again. Would you recommend it before transplantation? For fragile patients, uh, or, or is it the same indication like in patients who will not go into renal transplantation? Oh, very good question, Dr. Magdi. Thank you for the smart question. Um, okay. So let, let me tell you something here. So uh, we do the bone biopsy if we are not sure about what's going on in the bone. So if the patient has high, you know, BTH, BTH of 600, 700, 800, we don't need probably the value of doing bone biopsy for this patient would be lower because this patient probably, you know, a very high chance of having high turnover bone disease. On the other hand, if the BTH is two digits, less than 100, you know, or less than 150, the chances of having low turnover bone disease is high. So in this two spectrum or two extremes, we don't like to do bone biopsy. But if the patient has a BTH of 200, 300, 400, and has bone loss, so you do DEXA scan and both the BMD and the TBS is, is low. Or the patient already fractured or, or have high incidence of fracture or we did a FRAX score. You know, uh, we are going, I think Karim and others are going to touch on this FRAX score. And the 10-year the probability of fracture is high. So we need to do something. We need to understand what's going on on this patient uh, bone, especially this patient is getting a transplant. Actually, we thought in the past that transplant is going to improve the CKD MVD, but also you'll be surprised that majority of our patient, they continue to lose bone after kidney transplantation, mainly because of the immunosuppressive uh, uh, effects. So they lose the ROD part, so because the kidney function is better, renal osteodystrophy might be a little bit better, but hyperbara actually can persist up to a year and sometimes it need baritharidectomy after transplantation. And also bone loss because of increased bone resorption and suppression of bone formation can happen because of the long term use of steroids and others. So it depends if you don't know, if you want to do everything possible to improve your vision quality of life and decrease fracture and to improve the survival, uh, you need at least to do non-invasive tests first. If you're not sure after doing the non-invasive biomarker and uh, the high resolution image, of course, there is a good room to do the gold standard diagnosis, which is a bone biopsy. Uh, there is a question in the chat box about, would you like to do uh screening for osteoporosis for all in the stage of these patients? Uh, that's a, another very good question. So the, uh, I, I think Iman also is going to mention this. And so for high risk patient, you know, for osteoporosis. So if there is any risk for osteoporosis or prior history of fracture. So if the patient has 
family history of uh, fracture, especially you know long uh, bone fracture or we call it major osteoporotic fracture, like hip fracture, you know, fracture hip femur, neck femur, something like that. Uh, if the patient um, is sedentary or if the patient has secondary osteoporosis, either because of liver disease, because of endocrine disorder like thyroid exposes, or because of the high turnover or low turnover, you know, either the BTH is very low or, or very high. So if the patient have high risk, yes, we do DEXA scan. There's something that doesn't tell you in the uh, key DIGO guideline, how often do you need to repeat the DEXA scan and what, what to do after doing the DEXA scan. And this, I will leave this to uh, Iman to discuss just in a little bit. Uh, one last question, and uh, then I will leave Professor Rader to complete the questions. Uh, uh, he's asking about the availability of pathologists that can read bone biopsy in Egypt. Do you know anyone who can read it? Because, because uh, you know, I worked in bone biopsy 24 years, 24 years ago, and it was right. a problem for me to find a pathologist. Yeah, it's, a, it's another good question. I like this practical question. Sometimes I get just theoretical question, but these are very good practical question that tells you that people wants to uh, learn and to improve their practice. Um, yes, so, so which pathologist do you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are building up a team, uh, not only for the pathologist, but also who will do the bone biopsy. So we uh, train uh, Mamdou, uh, so far, uh, he is with us at the University of Kentucky. He's coming back to Egypt uh, next month to um, lead the team for the bone biopsy team. We are also in a stage of uh, uh, getting another uh, pathologist to learn how to do the histomorphometry analysis. So it's just a matter of time. So far, we do biopsies in Egypt and we uh, do the histomorphometry part in University of Kentucky because we have very uh, you know, well-known, internationally recognized histomorphometry lab in our division. Uh, if you have a patient, you can tell us, and we are going to discuss. We are, I have done a bone biopsy for a patient in Taluan, University of Taluan, uh, last time when I was in Egypt uh, a couple months ago. And we have uh, our histomorphometrist just to have finished interpreting and reading the, the uh, pathology. And we are going to discuss it tomorrow. So yeah, if you have patient or uh, you know series of patients that you would like to proceed with bone biopsy, the, you are welcome. And uh, Mamdou and our team, we have at least four or five in the pipeline that are working on that. So you tell us, and we'll take care of the rest. We'll take care of the bone biopsy, uh, you know, to take out the specimen, and we are going to transfer the specimen for free and uh, um, read the pathology and give you the final report for free. So that's my job so far. We are doing this in University of Kentucky. Hopefully within a year or two, we are going to do this in Mansoura University. We just need, you know, the, uh, we call it center, centers of excellency. We don't have to have bone histometry lab in each uh, university. If we have two or three labs or two or three, you know, expert teams, that should cover the whole nation. You know, by the way, I, I have done more than 100 bone biopsy and I'm willing to participate and to, to do bone biopsy for anyone who wants to learn how to do it. I have even, I have the, the needles for it in, in my lab. Very good, so very good. I can participate whenever you want. And now we'll I'll be happy because professor. we actually, we are actually also in a phase of uh, uh, collecting more and more cases and publishing the bone biopsy experience in Egypt. So it would be great. And uh, yeah, we can uh, talk about it and share ideas after this meeting. This is actually okay. one of the aim and objective for this meeting is to share I ideas and information. So we'll be happy to contribute with you, Professor Magdi. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Gada now can take uh, the rest of questions. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor Magdi, and thank you, Dr. Amr, for this elegant presentation, as usual. 
Um, we have a, one experience of uh, getting bone biopsy here in Egypt with Professor Amr and the specimen was uh, uh, transferred to uh, USA and read, and this was highly impressive. Uh, and we will highly impress with the results as well. So for your presentation, Dr. Amr, we still have um, some questions here. Yeah, we have. Um... So we have a question um, is, is every in the search, uh, we did this, what are drugs used for treatment of a dynamic bone disease in, in the market? Um, you hear me, Muhammad, is my voice reaching you? Yes. Do you want me to read the question? Okay, no, no, I feel that I, it's okay. I, I, um, I think that I, you are not hearing me as you read the questions. It's okay. Okay. We are hearing you very well, Dr. Ghada. So if you, if you would like to um, give me the question, uh, I will no, be more no. than happy. If not, no, 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 I am confused about the questions. There is many questions. Which one you choose, uh, so, Muhammad? Uh, so the next question is, what are the drugs used for treatment of a dynamic bone disease present in the market? Right, right. Very good question. Again, uh, tomorrow we'll have management of osteoporosis and CKD patients and the management of CKD MBD. A very good lecture, very yeah. good speaker from Dr. <laughs> Ahmed Abdul Wahab and the Manduh, uh, Muhammad Manduh. So I don't want to burn out that. But uh, first of all, you have to understand why the patient have a low turnover or a dynamic bone disease. So this happened usually because we oversuppress the BTH. So try to increase the BTH maybe to 300 or 400 by giving less calcium. If you are using high dialysate calcium, you can uh, go down on this. If you can cust you know, customize, customize the uh, uh, dialysate calcium. Also, you can stop the calcium containing phosphate binders. So use non-calcium containing phosphate binders. Uh, stop the vitamin D analog. If you're giving calcium or alpha calcidol, you need to uh, uh, stop that. So try to increase the BTH a little bit. If all of these doesn't help, of course, there is osteoanabolics that we can use like teribaratide, abalobaratide, and romosuzumab. And I will leave, I will leave uh, these uh, details for tomorrow's uh, presentation. Inshallah, Dr. Ram. Yeah, we have another um, question, and I think it could be the same. Maybe Dr. Iman will cover it. Uh, so Dr. Masoud asked if the patient has IBTH less than 150 post uh, parasyridectomy, can we give him calcium and one alpha to avoid hyperbara? Um, yeah, Mahmoud Sobh is going to discuss a case of uh, post parasyridectomy, hypoparathyroidism, and hypocalcemia just uh, next hour. So please stay with us and we'll have a long discussion with Dr. Halawa, who's an expert in parathyroidectomy and we'll have, uh, inshallah, a very thoughtful discussion about that. Okay. So, okay, I think we, we are ready to go, uh, to go to the next presentation. If you want, I will unmute. So Karim, uh, go ahead and share your screen, okay. please. Excuse me. Okay, Kareem, ask the on mute. And we have Dr. Ahmed Al Saeed. Dr. Ahmed Al Saeed. And we have Dr. Kamal. Okay. So, Dr. Ahmed Al Saeed, Dr. Muhammad Kamal, Dr. Kareem, Hadaratko, the mic, Maftouh Mahadrat. Okay. Uh, thank you, Muhammad uh, Mamdouh. And thank you, Dr. Amr, for your uh, very precious uh, presentation. I have the pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my uh, dear uh, colleague and brother, uh, Dr. Karim Nagati, lecturer of nephrology in Mansoura University. He is going to introduce a case, a uh, present a case about the lady with bone pain. Uh, so uh, go on, Karim. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Uh, يعني we will present two usual cases from our dialysis units. حاجة بنشوفها كل يوم. Uh, يعني بنعتبرها بس مقدمة إن شاء الله للمحاضرات اللي هتكون بكرة. كمانجمنت محاضرة المانجمنت بتاعت البون مينرال ديزيز ومحاضرة المانجمنت بتاعت الأستيو بروزيس اللي هيتقالوا بكرة إن شاء الله. فإحنا بس بنفكر يعني هنفكر بعض بالحالات اللي إحنا بنشوفها اللي هتحتاج المانجمنت ده كده في صورة التو كيسز دول إن شاء الله. 
First case is a 77 year old lady with history of CKD and started hemodialysis four years ago. She is hypertensive, cardiomyopathic, has AF, but not diabetic. 10 years ago, she was diagnosed as osteoporosis case. She received the treatment with zoledronic acid for one year. Six years ago, she has a standing height pole and the fissure fracture at the hip. For three years now, she has persistent bone aches and difficulty in walking. This is the main pre presentation, three years with persistent bone aches and difficulty in walking, and she is on dialysis for six years. Uh, about the drug history, she received amiodarone and bisoprolol and warfarin, but stopped warfarin since one year. She has a surgical history for spinal stenosis and spondylolitis. This is about 10 years ago. We did DEXA scan for here, and the results of DEXA scan are available. Lumbar spine, uh, uh, minus 2.6. Femur neck, minus 2.8. Uh, the femur minus 2.6 and the forearm minus 3. So she has osteoporosis, significant osteoporosis. We calculated the FRAX score. The uh, FRAX score the fracture assessment tool to predict the risk, the future risk for fractures. Uh, some data, uh, as we see, as we see, we first the country that we the patient, and then we the data that we have age, sex, weight, height, uh, history of previous fractures, current smoking, steroid use, rheumatoid arthritis, presence or absence, secondary osteoporosis causes, alcohol, and the results of DEXA scan. بعد ما نحسب السكور ده بيطلع لنا ريزالتس الفراكس سكور فور اور بيشنت ووز ميجر فور ميجر اوستريو بروست بروتيك فراكشرز ووز 12% اند فور هيب فراكشرز ووز 4.1 هاو تو انتربريت ذس سكور ذا ناشونال اوستيوبروزس فاونديشن ريكومندس اوستيوبروزس تريتمنت ان بيشنت ويز لو بون ماس ان هوم 10 يير بروبابيلتي اوف هيب فراكشر 3% سو اور بيشنت هاز 4.1 ويتش از مور ذان 3 or more uh, in whom uh, uh, the risk of measure uh, or whom uh, uh, at the measure of osteoporosis related fracture is more than 20 percent about the moon binaural status the graph kida bishrah lina serial calcium of sphor in the last two years halai in the calcium can fi mawzam al arayat kan fuq al tamania yani yimkin kaman muqarrab min al tisa ma bin al tisa wal ashra fi mawzam al arayat وفي قرايه في مارس 2021 وصل 8 و8 من 10. ده السيريال فوسفورس خلال برضو اخر سنتين كان دايما ما بين الاربعه والسته، مره واحده برضو في مارس 2021 وصل 7.1، وذا لاست ريدنج فور كالسيوم اند فوسفورس الكالسيوم 8.8 اند الفوسفورس 3.8. عند البوينت دي في مارس 2021 اللي وصل فيها الكالسيوم 8.8 اند الفوسفورس 7.1 وي ستارت الكالسيوم كربونيت اند سيبيلامير از فوسفيت بايندرز. السيريال بي تي اتش خلال اللاست تو ييرز برضو كان البدايه بتاعتنا البي تي اتش اراوند 150 بعد كده نزل تحت ال 100 في قرايه بعدها تحت ال 250 عند 150 اند ذا لاست ريدنج ووز 77. يبقى ده السيريال كالسيوم وفوسفورس وبي تي اتش في اللاست تو ييرز زي ما اتفقنا عند مارس 2021 لما الفوسفورس علا بدانا فوسفيت بايندر صوره كالسيوم وهتوضح في الجدول ده اكتر عند مارس 2021 لما الفوسفورس علا بدانا فوسفيت بايندر صوره كالسيوم كربونيت وسيفيلامير في القرايه اللي بعدها في يونيو 2021 لما الفوسفورس بدا ينزل البي تي اتش وصل 139 الكالسيوم موز 9 وي ستوب اول تريتمنت بعدها في اكتوبر 2021 البي تي اتش استمر في النزول وصل 77 فاللاست ريدنج البي تي اتش 77 كالسيوم 8.8 اند فوسفورس 3.8 يبقى فور ذا كونكلوجن اوف ذيس كيس وي هاف ثري بروبلمز وي هاف اوستيوبروزس وي هاف احتماليه لو تيرن اوفر بون ديزيز بيكوز وي هاف لو بي تي اتش ويتش 77 بس تو كونفيرم ذات ات از لو تيرن اوفر اور نوت وي نيد ا بون بايوبسي ويتش واز نوت دان But it may be low turnover bone disease, and we have persistent bone in and difficulty walking. We هنا هيبع عندنا سؤال حوالين the management of this case. How to manage the case with this with this combination? 
ده اباوت الفيرست كيس هنأجل الدسكشن للاخر لما نقول السكند كيس اللي هي تقريبا هتبقى واخده نفس الصوره We have a 65 year old lady with history of hemodialysis since 10 years. She has no other comorbidities. For the last four years, she has persistent generalized bone aches. For the drug history, she also she only takes famotidine. This is the results of DEXA scan. The lumbar spine minus 2.9 and the forearm minus 2.6. So we have osteoporosis. We have osteopenia in the femur neck and the total femur with minus two in the femur neck and minus 1.6 at the femur. So we have osteoporosis. Again, we calculated the Prescott score for the lady, which showed major osteoporotic fractures, 5.7%, hip fractures, 1.4%. About the moon, the bone mineral status. This is the serial calcium. Uh, in the last two years, during the last two years, was above nine. The last reading for the calcium, 8.1. The phosphorus was uh, above 2.5. The last reading for, for phosphorus is three. BTH started with about 400, then below 300, below 300. In June uh, uh, 2021, it reached 521. At this, we started calcium and alpha calcidol. Again, in the table, this is the serial BTH, the serial calcium and the serial phosphorus. We started treatment with calcium and alpha calcidol when the BTH reached 521 at June 2021. This lady has bone pain, osteoporosis, and the state of bone turning over is not clear. Is it with a normal BTH or high turnover? We don't know exactly the result of this turnover. Our question is about the management of two cases. أعتقد إن ده يعني هنفتح له باب discussion عشان نعرف رأي حضراتكم إزاي نمانج these two cases وإيه اللي محتاجين نعمله قبل إن شاء الله ما نسمعه في المحاضرة بتاعت بكرة. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karim, for your uh, nice presentation. Now we can uh, take. Now we can take questions. Uh, okay, we have uh, two questions in the chat. First, uh, I think from Dr. Halawa, what is the alkaline phosphatase level? And again, the same question: What about the bone alkaline phosphatase? The total alkaline phosphatase for the first case was one hundred. One hundred. The second case, 450. But we have no bone specific alkaline phosphatase. The first case was 100, and the second case, 450. Mungkin I'm going to ask you to ask you to ask me to ask you to ask me to ask me دكتور احمد ممكن اه اتفضل انا ما عنديش اي سؤال ثاني بس كنت عاوز اعرف الكلام في السبوتيز ليفل اوف كورس يو نو اي مين ذا بي تي اتش از ا سيرجن اي وونت بي اكسايتد وذ ذيس لو ليفل اوف بي تي اتش يو نو بيكوز ذيس از ويزن ذا كيديكو جايد لاين 3 تو 9 ذا نورمال سو موست لايكلي از ا ميديكال ايشو اند كيو ان اس يعني I'm, I'm not sure whether it's low turnover. I think um, the you know, alkaline phosphatase will help. What about the bone biopsy in this case? I will leave it to the experts. ممكن الدكتور عمرو يشارك معنا من دفعه اذنك الدكتور عمرو يقول لنا رايه في موضوع ان احنا نعمل بون بايوبسيس فور ذيس كيسز. تمام. Sorry, Mamdouh muted me. Okay, Masha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a very interesting uh, kids presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Karim. Very nice presentation. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we choose actually these two cases because they are very, very frequent. We see this every day in our dialysis practice. Patient with increased risk of fracture or already had fracture 
with uh, uh, osteoporosis by DEXA scan, and we don't know how to deal with uh, these patients. So the first patient, it looks like the PTH was on the large side, which um, might indicate that this patient might have low um, turnover bone disease. Again, we are not very sure because uh, this is not the gold standard or uh, to be sure, you need to do at least bone turnover biomarkers to see what is the bone formation rate, what is the bone resorption. Then if the bone formation is low, if the bone resorption is low, I mean, if the bone specific alkaline phosphatase is low or even the total alkaline phosphatase is on the lower side, 100 for CKD patient, you know, on dialysis, uh, total alkaline phosphatase is still on the lower side. So this might be another indication for low turnover bone disease. If you want to be precise, if you want to be, um, you know, certain that this patient has low turnover bone disease, you need to do more biomarkers. So bone specific alkaline phosphatase, trap 5 b then bone biopsy, of course, this will give you not only assessment of the bone turnover, but also the mineralization and the bone volume. So if after all of this, again, we, you might be surprised that this patient might have aluminum intoxication and uh, we're going to talk about this tomorrow or iron toxicity or oxalosis or other rare, you know, disease, myelodosis or something like that. So you might be surprised uh, with other results, but you need, you know, the most common is low turnover bone disease followed by high turnover bone disease, then the mixed renal osteodystrophy and osteomalacia. So bone biopsy will tell you, if you cannot do that, do, um, you know, the uh, non-invasive uh, bone turnover markers. Then the question will come, okay, this patient has low turnover bone disease, okay, by bone uh, turnover marker, by bone biopsy, by whatever, then how to treat this low turnover bone disease? As we mentioned, that first thing to decrease the calcium load. These patients are on a positive calcium load and calcium, which is usually 99% in the bone, cannot uh, be utilized in the bone because the bone is dead. The turn turnover is very low. So if you give more calcium and the bone is inactive, that should take 99% of this calcium. What happens? The patient will have increased cardiovascular calcification and this will suppress the BTH more. So it will induce more low turnover bone disease. So avoid giving calcium. Try to lower down the serum calcium a little bit. Try to decrease the dialysate calcium if you can do that. Try to avoid calcium containing phosphate binders. Try to stop vitamin D and vitamin D analogs. All of this will help. Give it time. If you do all of this and it doesn't help, and you are certain that this patient has low turnover bone disease and osteoporosis, you can re-measure, reassess the uh, uh, BMD. And the, again, we talked about the TPS, the trabecular bone score. If this patient has poor quality, and has bad bone mineral density, so both quantity and quality is bad, and you remeasure that, and the patient is deteriorating in a year or two years, so the patient is still is actively uh, losing bone, you need to do something. Here is the something that you can do. We have different osteoanabolics, teriparatide, which is 134 BTH. You can give that, it's every day sub-Q injection. Then we have abaloparatide, which is BTHRB. It's another alternative. It's, uh, it's not uh, uh, cheap, so it's expensive. And the third one is romosuzumab. And romosuzumab, actually, there was um, a concern about increasing cardiovascular toxicity or cardiovascular calcification and increasing uh, the cardiovascular disease. However, there was a study that was published from Japan in 2021, and it showed that it's safe and effective, romosuzumab. So it's called Evanity. Um, so anyway, we have different osteoanabolics to improve the bone formation rate, especially romosuzumab also uh, increase the bone resorption a little bit. Uh, so it, it helps with, with both to you know, build up more bone and to strengthen the bone. So these medications are still optional. It hasn't been studied very well in CKD vision. However, there is some 
small study showed safety and uh, efficacy, so you still can consider these medications. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> we have some questions in the chat. So Sobh said the, the patient was afraid to proceed uh, for the bone biopsy. This is why he, we wouldn't take the biopsy for him. We have a question about drugs that contribute to osteoporosis. Very good. That's another very good question. So uh, yeah, you need to also see if the patient is taking any medication that induce osteoporosis, <laughs> not only medication, but also smoking or sedentary life. So if the patient is a smoker, he or she, need to uh, quit smoking. If the patient is inactive or in sedentary life, he needs to be involved in a physical therapy program, at least in the, our dialysis unit, and we talked about it several times. Try to get a physical therapy machine in your dialysis unit. The patient is staying with, with, with us for at least three hours or three and a half or four hours, three times a week. So if you get a ergometer or, or any machine that the vision can exercise, you can just put it on the bed while the vision is uh, uh, sitting, uh, you know, or lying in the bed, he can exercise using his legs and move. So, and also encourage the vision to, to be active and to have better sun exposure, improve the vitamin D level if the vitamin D level is very low. Um, so all of this can improve, you know, organic, uh, healthy, diet so healthy lifestyle with uh, exercise and uh, and good uh, food all of this will uh, should uh, at least help again medication that uh, in, you know induce bone loss in, including corticosteroids heparin that we use in dialysis actually can increase bone resorption so try to minimize the heparin as much as you can as long as there is no significant clotting problem gives the lowest dose of heparin uh, there is uh, warfarin also because it's vitamin K antagonist. Vitamin K is essential for vitamin D to work on the bone to increase bone formation. So actually, uh, vitamin uh, K antagonist, you know, the warfarin um, and the comedin increase bone loss. So there is uh, anti-epileptic medications also. The old anti-epileptic medication, phenytoin, uh, increase the bone resorption. So yeah, you have to review all the uh, medical history and the patient medication and try to minimize this thing. Proton bump inhibitor actually can also induce bone disease. The evidence is not very strong, but at least don't give 80 milligram of uh, protonics as the BBIs. You can give 40 milligram or as needed or 20 milligrams, the lowest possible dose because when you abolish and you decrease the acidity of the stomach, you decrease the absorption of minerals as well. So there is, uh, you know, you can review all the medical history and try to uh, um, stop the unnecessary medication. And here with the low turnover bone disease, especially calcium supplements, you know, a lot of uh, the ulcers patients, they are getting unnecessarily, you know, vitamins and calcium and minerals. So we need to stop that. I think I have a couple minutes uh, to move. Uh, so the second the case, Karim presented a very nice case uh, that probably have high turnover bone disease, BTH ranges in about 300, 400, up to 500 with bone loss and osteoporosis. Again, this high turnover bone disease, if you are certain, and we are not going to talk again about the bone biopsy and biomarkers, if you are certain that this patient has high turnover bone disease, you need to lower down the BTH so you need to give more vitamin D analogs. We need to give Sinacalcid, the Sensibar, the calcium mimetics. And now we have uh, also calcitide, which is an IV form of calcium mimetics. So we need to control the BTH, the calcium and phosphorus and CKD and BD parameters. Then someone might ask about osteoporotic anti-resorptive therapy like bisphosphonates and dinozumab, and I will leave this to further lectures. 
Sorry. Let's move to Dr. Kareem presentation. Was muted. Sorry. دكتور لا لا مفيش مشكله خلاص انا معاكم انا انا كنت بسمع دكتور عمرو يعني اوكي ليتس ليتس ثانك يو سو ماتش ثانك يو يعني ليتس موف تو ايمانز ليكشر اوكي سو يو كان ستوب شير دكتور كريم اف يو وونت اي ويل اسك ايمان تو ان ميوت دكتور ناجي دكتور علاء ازاي حضرتك؟ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. It's really a pleasure to participate in this very conjoined Kentucky Mansura meeting. And for introducing the next speaker, I would like to thank those who stand beyond this great event. In order not to forget any one of them, but I would like to thank Professor Amr Hussaini. Uh, Professor Mustafa Absalam, Mamdouh, Sobh, Nahla, and everyone actually who participated in organizing this event. Uh, we know that the guidelines are uh, uh, changeable and uh, uh, we have a major change from the uh, TDU guidelines regarding the uh, uh, diagnosis and tools used for diagnosis and management of uh, CPD in between. Uh, Iman Nagy, one of the eminent uh, lecturers of nephrology in our unit, uh, will try to throw lights on the major changes that has happened from the TDU guideline 2009 and 2017. And after she finished, you will be more, more than happy to receive your questions. Iman Nagy, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ale. <clears throat> Uh, my topic today is about summary of updated uh, KDIGO CKD MBD guidelines 2017. Uh, first, uh, bone abnormalities in uh, chronic kidney disease uh, are common and they lead to significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, she, uh, it, was, um, it was called uh, renal ST dystrophy, but um, in 2005, a broader term was, uh, was, uh, was uh, introduced, which is uh, CKD MBD. Uh, which is a systemic disorder of mineral and wound metabolism due to uh, CKD manifested by either one or a combination of the following. First, abnormalities in uh, laboratory like calcium, phosphorus, PTH, or vitamin D. Abnormalities in the bone in the form of in turnover, mineralization, volume, linear growth, or strength, and or vascular presence of vascular or other soft tissue calcification. The uh, GDIGO uh, guidelines was developed in 2003, and the first guidelines for uh, diagnosis, evaluation, prevention, and treatment of CKD MPD was developed in uh, 2009. And uh, in 2017, uh, a selective update of uh, period CKD, CKD MPD guidelines was published. Uh, uh, the GDIGO uh, con convened a conference in 2013 uh, entitled CKD MPD Back. Uh, to the future due to the development uh, of uh, several studies uh, they identified 12 recommendations for the evaluation and the additional topic questions uh, these are chapters uh, in kdigo cqd mvd uh, guidelines uh, chapter one for introduction and definition of cqd mvd chapter two for methodological approach chapter uh, 3.1 for diagnosis of uh, bio biochemical abnormalities of cqd mvd chapter 3.2 for uh, diagnosis of bone abnormalities in cqd mvd chapter 3.3 for diagnosis of vascular calcification in cqd mvd Chapter 4.1 for treatment of CKD MBD targeted at uh, lowering high serum phosphate and uh, maintaining serum calcium. Chapter 4.2 for treatment of abnormal BTH levels. 
Chapter 4.3 for treatment of bone with bisphosphonate and other osteoporosis medication. Chapter 5 for evaluation and treatment of kidney transplant bone disease. Uh, this uh, chapters in uh, two, uh, 2009 CDMPD guidelines. Uh, only uh, chapters in Eurocolor uh, are modified uh, and updated in the CKD, uh, uh, in updated CKD NBD guidelines in 2017. For every recommendation, there is a strength of recommendation and quality of supporting evidence. Uh, for sense of recommendation, there is level one and level two. Level one, uh, which mean we recommend, uh, which mean uh, which means that the risk and the benefit out with the risk. Uh, for level two, we suggest which means that the risk and the benefit are not clearly, uh, not clearly and balanced. Uh, for quality of supporting evidence, there is four, uh, four evidence, uh, A, B, C, and D. For A, which means high evidence in uh, systematic uh, review and randomized control trials. B, moderate evidence, which uh, yielded from uh, cohort and case control studies. For C, uh, evidence, which mean low evidence uh, yielded from uh, some case control studies, case series, and case reports. For D, very low evidence for editorial and uh, expert opinion. Uh, first, for chapter 3.1, which uh, titled, entitled uh, Diagnose of CKD NBD by Chemical Abnormalities. This is the first guideline was, which uh, was not updated, which recommends the recommend monitoring serum levels of calcium, phosphorus, PTH, and alkaline phosphatase beginning from uh, stage grade 3A of CKD. Mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, calcium and phosphorus uh, sh uh, should be kept in near normal range, which differ from lab to lab, uh, but mostly calcium should be kept between uh, 8.5 to 10.5, phosphorus uh, between 2.5 to 4.5, and BTH uh, should be kept uh, to, uh, to 9 upper limits of normal. Uh, for uh, monitoring, uh, for frequency of monitoring of this uh, lab um, markers, uh, it depends on a uh, stage of CKD and CKD progression. For serum calcium and phosphorus, uh, uh, begin from uh, stage data every six to 12 months, which increase uh, to uh, every one to three months in stage five CKD. Uh, for BTH uh, in stage three, uh, based on baseline level and CKD progression, which increased to every three to six months in stage five CKD. For alkaline phosphatase, uh, it should be uh, done for uh, every one year. Uh, the next guidelines about the uh, vitamin D level, uh, they suggest that uh, the uh, vitamin D level might be measured and repeated this thing to determine by baseline level and therapeutic intervention if there is insufficiency or deficiency. Uh, it is treated as in general population. Uh, for uh, three, uh, for uh, therapeutic decision uh, regarding CKD MBD, it should be based on trend rather than a single laboratory value. Uh, because of the um, faults in measuring the calcium, phosphorus, and TBTH, uh, there is a change in the measurement according to the time of the sample drone and according to uh, the, if there is uh, after meal or before meal. And uh, for BTH, according to the um, uh, method used for first or second or third generation BTH, so uh, we should, uh, we rec they recommend that we should depend on uh, trend rather than single laboratory value. Uh, for uh, calcium phosphorus product, they suggest that we uh, not use this, uh, we not use the product as well, but use individual values of calcium and phosphorus. Uh, for uh, the sample, uh, for for sampling of uh, this uh, laboratory marker, uh, they recommend that clinical laboratories should uh, inform clinician about the actual say method used, and if there is any change of the method or sample source. Uh, for uh, the first, uh, the first guideline changed or updated in uh, these uh, guidelines uh, is uh, 3.2.2, which um, states that CKD uh, in patient with CKD uh, grade three to five uh, with evidence of CKD in BD, suggest that PMD testing not be performed routinely because the BMD doesn't predict fracture diseases in the old guidelines. There is, uh, until that, there is no uh, studies that uh, should, uh, showed that BMD can predict uh, fracture risk in patients with CKD. But uh, after uh, this guidelines, there is multiple studies 
um, like first is the diagnostic usefulness of the bone mineral density and the biochemical markers of bone turnover in predicting fracture in CKD stage 5D patient. Uh, in this study, BMD was measured annually and set up biochemistry monthly for um, 485 hemodialysis patients. And they concluded that the BMD by DEXA scan, especially as a total hip region, was useful to predict any type of fracture for females with low VTH. Another study which entitled the comparison of fracture risk prediction among individuals with reduced and normal kidney function. This is a study with a four, they do a FRAX score for, pa for patients with reduced and normal kidney function. And they concluded that FRAX was able to predict a major osteoporotic fracture in individuals with reduced kidney function. Uh, BMD testing was one item of the FRAX score. Uh, another study, um, bone mineral density and the fracture risk in older individuals with CKD, uh, they uh, measure BMD also in uh, older patient, uh, patient age more than 65 years with uh, and without CKD, and they concluded that BMD provide information on risk for fracture in older individual with or without moderate CKD. Based on this, uh, based on this study, this um, uh, guideline was updated to. <laughs> Uh, in patients with CKD grade 3A to grade 5 with evidence of CKD MBD and or risk factors for osteoporosis, we suggest BMD testing to assess fracture risk if result will impact the treatment decision. So BMD testing uh, not return, return used, but it is, it is used if, uh, if, it, if its results impact the treatment decision, which is a fake uh, statement. Okay, so uh, regional physics updates, uh, as I said, there is mul uh, multiple perspective studies documented that lower DEXA scan, uh, lower uh, BMD predict a fracture in patients with CKD. Uh, thus, uh, if a low or declining BMD will lead to additional intervention to reduce falls or use osteoporosis uh, medication, assessment, uh, BMD assessment is reasonable. The second uh, guideline was modified in diagnosis of CKD MBD was uh, 3.1, uh, 3.2.1, uh, uh, which uh, stated CKD with the grade uh, 3A to grade 5D. It is reasonable to perform a bone biopsy in various se settings, include uh, unexplained fracture, persistent bone pain, unexplained hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia, possible aluminum toxicity, and ability to syrup with bisphosphonate. But, um, also, uh, there is some studies which um, uh, growing evidence and some studies which uh, show the efficacy and efficacy and safety of the use of anti reservative drugs in patients with CKD. Uh, there is a study which uh, titled Effect of Raluxifen Treatment in Postomolobosal Women with CKD, which is a multi center randomized placebo controlled trial in Postomolobosal Women with Osteoporosis. Uh, and use raloxifen uh, uh, with assessment of the uh, CKD uh, stage. Uh, and they concluded that raloxifen increases BMD at both uh, hip and spine and reduces the risk of vertebral fracture among an individual with CKD. Uh, another study, alendronate treatment in women with normal to severely impaired renal function and analysis of the fracture intervention trial. Uh, they um, they uh, use uh, Patient in fraction intervention trial, which was an randomized controlled trial of alendronate or placebo uh, with estimation of a baseline uh, creatinine clearance. And they concluded that alendronate is safe and effective at increasing BMD and reducing the fracture uh, among uh, patients uh, with reduced renal function. Another study uh, effects of denosumab on fracture and bone mineral density by level of kidney function. Uh, they use the uh, denosumab among the subjects, but uh, participating also in fra uh, fracture uh, reduction evaluation of denosumab in osteoporosis every six months, uh, with estimation also of creatinine clearance. And they uh, concluded that denosumab is effective at redu reducing the fracture risk and is not associated with an increase in adverse event among the patient with impaired kidney function. So, uh, based on this uh, studies this, uh, and, uh, and the many other studies, this uh, uh, guideline was modified to, uh, uh, it is reasonable to perform a bone biopsy if knowledge of the type of renal SD dystrophy will impact treatment decision. Uh, 
solutional for this update as the primary motivation for this revision was the growing evidence that osteoporosis medication as in these studies can be used in CKD uh, and it was uh, effective and safe and uh, was not associated with uh, low, uh, low, uh, low turnover bone disease or a dynamic bone disease. And they can um, uh, prevent uh, instance of a uh, decreasing instance of fracture. Uh, bone biopsy, which uh, is the gold standard for uh, diagnosis of the bone abnormalities in the uh, CKD, uh, because the uh, DEXA scan cannot um, know the type of uh, uh, turnover bone disease. And for uh, uh, biochemical markers, it is not um, highly sensitive or specific, and there is uh, a change in, uh, in their measurement. Uh, so the bone uh, biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis in, in the bone abnormalities in CKD. And its goal, it uh, roll out a typical or unexpected bone pathology. Uh, it determine whether the patient has high or low turnover disease, which may alter the medication. And it identify a mineralization defect that would alter treatment. But the bone biopsy is invasive and they're not uh, available in uh, every place. Um, and it needs specialist in antipathology. So, uh, if the, um, so if the use of antiserapative therapy in patients with DKD can be, uh, can, uh, can be, can be used uh, without uh, if the type of a uh, if the type of renal, uh, if renal osteotrophy or uh, bone turnover in CKD patient uh, without invasive, um, invasive method uh, like bone biopsy, so we can use this uh, therapy without uh, the use of the uh, bone biopsy. Uh, so if the DEXA scan and the bone turnover, uh, like that the patient has, uh, may have uh, a low turnover bone disease, so we, uh, uh, a high turnover bone disease, so we can use anti-resorbative therapy to decrease the risk of fracture without the need for bone biopsy as it is not available in every place. But if the physician or clinician cannot uh, cannot uh, say if this uh, high or uh, cannot determine the turnover bone disease of situation, so they need to perform a bone biopsy. Uh, so the, the lack of ability to perform a bone biopsy may not justify withholding anti-reservative therapy to patient at high risk of fracture. So uh, high or bone disease. Uh, after that, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the following guideline about the uh, measurement of xenon BTH or bone specific alkaline phosphatase. These are just the use of cis uh, biomarkers to evaluate the bone disease uh, because markedly high or low value predicts the underlying bone turnover. Uh, they suggest uh, not returning measure bone derived turnover marker of collagen synthesis and the breakdown. Uh, for vascular calcification and CKD and BD, uh, the guidelines was, uh, not, were not changes. Uh, we not to change it. First, uh, was CKD uh, uh, use the lateral abdominal radiograph can be used to detect the presence or absence of vascular calcification, and echocardiogram can be used to detect the presence or absence of valvular calcification, and they uh, be, can be used. Again, these are just they. This can be used to a reasonable alternative to CT based imaging. The second was um, that the patient with CKD, uh, with CKD with non vascular or valvular calcification may be considered at high risk cardiovascular. Uh, cardiovascular. Uh, as regards treatment, I speak a, a small hint about the treatment of CKD MBD as it uh, will be demonstrated by Dr. Ahmed Abdel Hafta, inshallah. Uh, first, in patient, uh, this is a, a new guideline uh, which is not uh, uh, found, uh, not uh, present in uh, the old guidelines, uh, which uh, says that in patient with CKD, uh, the treatment of CKD and BD should be based on serial assessment of phosphate, calcium, and PTH level considered together, as I said before. Second, uh, it says, uh, uh, regarding the serum phosphorus, uh, first, uh, pre-dialysis patient, we uh, suggest, uh, these are just to maintain serum phosphate in normal, uh, in normal range, but in patient who on dialysis, uh, lower elevated phosph uh, phosphate level. But in the new guideline, these are just to treat the hyperphosphatemia and to not choose the phosphate binding, uh, phosphate binding agent in pre-dialysis patient if the patient has normal phosphate because of the adverse, agent, uh, adverse effects of this uh, uh, drugs. Uh, second uh, guideline was about the uh, serum calcium. Uh, all the guidelines, they uh, suggest to maintain serum calcium in the normal range, but uh, because of the, the adverse effect of the positive uh, calcium balance and uh, 
اذا بيشن كان توليريت الاسيمتوماتيك لو لو مايلد هايبوكالسيميا سو زي سجست ذات افويد يعني زي افويد الهايبركالسيميا ان ادلت بيشن ويز سي كي دي ان ذيس جايد لاين اونلي انكريز ذا ايفيدنس فروم 2 دي تو دو سي بس ذا جايد لاين اتس سيم ان بيشن ويز سي كي دي جريت 5 دي ويز سجست يوزنج ادلت كالسيوم كونسنتريشن بيتوين 1.25 تو اند 1.50 Milli mol per liter. For using the phosphate binding agent treatment of hyperphosphatemia, they suggest using the phosphate binding agent treatment of hyperphosphatemia in CGD. But in the updated updated guidelines, they not use phosphate binding agent, but use phosphate lowering, not binding agent, to involve phosphate binding agent dialysis and phosphate restriction in the diet. Should be used only not to treat the hyperphosphatemia, to treat the progressively or persistently elevated serum phosphate. After that, the next recommendation about the dose of about restricting the dose of calcium in CKD patients in the updated guidelines, they generally restrict the calcium based phosphate binder in CKD patients with grade three A to grade five D, not. Only in some situation, generally restricted dose of calcium based because of the adversity to offer positive calcium balance. After that, about the dietary phosphate index in treatment of hyperphosphatemia, they added the the dietary pattern in in the CKD patient to because the phosphate restriction means protein restriction, which may lead to protein malnutrition, so they uh, add to consider phosphate uh, source because of the way available to phosphate in uh, some uh, uh, in additives uh, large than animal than the vegetable uh, uh, content, so they decrease um, the, 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 the diet with high bioavailability of phosphate. For uh, this, uh, after the guidelines, the optimal BTH is not known, but this suggests that the patient with level of intact BTH above the limit of normal to be uh, to be treated. But in the updated guidelines, they uh, should less uh, treat it only if the BTH prog progressively rising or persistently above the upper limit of normal, as mild increase of BTH may be uh, may be uh, in if uh, CKD may be adaptive response to due to hypocalcemia and and to hyperphosphatemia. After that, uh, for um, PTH is uh, progressively rising and remain persistently above a limit of normal, uh, we suggest treatment with calcium or vitamin D analog. But in the updated guidelines, they uh, suggest that uh, the calcium, calcium or vitamin D analog cannot, uh, shouldn't be routinely used. And uh, uh, they used only with severe and the progressive hyperparathyroidism. Uh, for elevated or uh, rising BTH, uh, this uh, guidelines is uh, only, يعني, they, is, uh, they said that uh, cal uh, any calcium myometic calcium or vitamin D analog, uh, all are first line for treatment of hyperparathyroidism. Uh, this uh, modification uh, rely on the, um, the modification made in the diagnosis of CKD MBD for the bone biopsy. For uh, all the all the guidelines, they said that the, uh, uh, before giving the anti-resorptive agent, we uh, bone biopsy is uh, should be done. But in the modified um, recommendation, they said that consideration of the bone biopsy, but uh, yeah, the use of anti-resorptive uh, agent not uh, sent for bone biopsy. For evaluation treatment of kidney transplant bone disease. Uh, in patients with grade one transplant, grade five transplant, with sickle factor for osteoporosis, these are suggest that PMD testing used to assess fracture risk if result with artery therapy, like a CKD patient without transplant. Uh, for uh, second uh, guidelines, uh, only uh, change it uh, to consider bone biopsy to guide treatment. This is the only change in the uh, guidelines. Uh, so the Kidibu updated the Kidibu guidelines is uh, in some uh, recommendation is general and not specified uh, like severe hyperthyroidism, progressive uh, rising, but there is no numbers. Uh, second, there is no uh, no sufficient guidelines for uh, uh, children or adolescents uh, CKD patients. Uh, 
Uh, so management uh, of CKD-MPD is complicated because of complexity uh, of the underlying pathophysiology, lack of uh, certainty and the multi-morbidity patient population. Uh, these guidelines move away from treating the specific target toward a more pragmatic and personalized approach to management. Um, uh, this uh, clinical practice guideline should be used in conjugation with clinical judgment because of lack of and equivocally action, actionable recommendations and several studies regarding these aspects are required. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayman, for summarizing the difference between TD guidelines, between the two guidelines actually, uh, in this uh, very short time. Thank you very much, and we will open the discussion if anyone have any questions. I think the, the, the major changes actually were the stress on the using of DEXA scan. And the second, uh, uh, the second change is uh, the indications of renal biopsy. The third one, the change of, uh, from phosphate binders to phosphate lowering the agents. I think these are the three uh, major changes. And also the indication of a parathyroid tool. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience or should we will move to the next speaker? I just have a quick uh, comment. More than Allow welcome. me, Dr. Ala. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iman, for this nice presentation. That's very hard uh, uh, to summarize all of this update just in 20 minutes. Uh, yes, I agree with Dr. Ala also that uh, the major changes um, has been the 180 degree changes on the BMD because BMD uh, by DEXA wasn't included as one of the recommendation in the prior um, recommendation. Actually, they elected not to do it because the studies uh, before 2009, the old Kidigo uh, guideline uh, showed that the BMD is not helpful to predict the fracture risk. However, this has been changed based on three randomized clinical trials that was published between 2009 and 2017. So now we have very good evidence to do DEXA scan for patients with evidence of CKD, MBD, and the increased risk of fracture or osteoporosis. And we need to deal with the consequence of that. <clears throat> so not only diagnosing osteoporosis, but also how to treat osteoporosis and to improve bone health. So the most important other uh, recommendation is to do bone biopsy if this is going to change the patient management or to decrease the chance of fracture. However, if you cannot do the bone biopsy, this shouldn't prevent you from treating the bone disease. So using our anti osteoporotic medication might be necessarily for our patient to improve their prognosis and to improve their quality of life. So don't be hesitant either to give bisphosphonates or denosumab for patients with evidence of uh, uh, you know, high turnover bone disease if you cannot control the osteoporosis and the CKD-MPD just by controlling the phosphorus, the calcium, the BTH. There is a room to use anti osteoporotic medication, which is mainly the bisphosphonates. So we have different kinds of bisphosphonates aura and, uh, and injections. And denosumab, uh, which is sub-Q injection every uh, six months, also you can give that. Uh, if there is no evidence of lotin over bone disease. If you give these two medications to a patient with lotin over bone disease, you're going to kill the patient, you're going to kill the bone, you're going to increase cardiovascular calcification. So before giving this medication, and uh, this medication is not going to be given for a month or two, you need to give it for a year or two at least. So if you're going to, or planning to give this medication, make sure at least the patient doesn't have lotin over uh, bone disease. My last comment is about the trend. You need to trend the markers, the BTH, the calcium and phosphorus. And as long as the patient is moving to the right direction, you don't have to be panic. If even the calcium or phosphorus or BTH are moving toward the wrong direction, even if they are still within the normal target, you need to intervene. Otherwise, if the BTH is say, uh, 300 from 200, then 400, still within two to nine folds of our limit of normal, but you need to do something because you see the trend is going up. So if you don't do anything, it will be 500, 600, and patient will have high turnover bone disease and bone loss. 
So you need to look to the trend and, you, and the other uh, magic word, you need to look to the whole picture. Don't look only to one abnormality. You need to, to look to the whole picture. My last uh, comment is uh, now this uh, um, uh, selective update, the 2017 update left us with uh, more flexibility. So it's not very rigid. Actually the 2009 was rigid, was strict. Now we are more flexible and you have more rule to improve your um, CKD MVD. So you just need to be knowledgeable and you just need to know what you are doing and what you are treating, then you can intervene. If you don't know, we have a lot of experts, we have a lot of, you can just ask for help if you have interesting case or even uh, non-interesting usual case that you see every day. And if you don't know how to treat this patient, you just ask, you just, uh, you know, uh, we have in, in Mansoura University now a lot of experts, you can discuss with them then we can see the best way and the precise way to treat uh, your uh, patient CKD, MBD, and osteoporosis. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Robert, for this clarification. Uh, Mamdouh, do we have any question? I think we have only one question from Dr. Iman Hussein. If Iman Nagy would like to answer. Yeah, the question is, what is phosphate-lowering agent? Calcium, renagel, or binder? Uh, phosphate lowering agent include the uh, first dietary restriction of phosphorus. Uh, second, uh, phosphate lowering agent including aluminum containing uh, calcium containing phosphate binder or non calcium non aluminum containing. Uh, include uh, third by diets. Okay. Okay. Okay, man, thank you very much. Should we move to, do we have any other question or should we move to the next speaker? Uh, no, I don't think that we have uh, any more questions. The next is, uh, will be a break for 10 minutes. Yeah, if you. So I think we can gather again, maybe uh, um, at, uh, it will be 5.50. Uh, yeah. Okay, 5.50, uh, anyone want to do salah or use a bathroom or take a break, uh, please uh, don't uh, uh, sign out from the Zoom meeting. We'll keep the Zoom meeting going. We'll just give uh, eight minutes a break and gather again uh, at uh, uh, in just in eight minutes, 5.50. Okay.